Yeah. We're not going to pass. No, 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 I'm good. All right. You guys are all ready? Sure. You guys are ready over there? Yeah, ready. Yeah. We got sound. We got video. We're all like in focus and stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Good evening and welcome to History So It Doesn't Repeat. I'm joined in studio by Tom Wilcutts, who's an independent attorney. And I'm joined by Chengi Aragavan, who is, how would I say, a political prisoner turned graduate of Oxford and Cambridge. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. For sure. Tonight, I thought we'd go through some of the basics because it's a new show and we really haven't developed a format yet. So the, the notes that I had would be to identify ourselves, which we just did, so that's a big win, to identify our purpose of why we're here sitting under the hot lights in a studio uh, and discussing things, what are our principles in discussing these things, and then going forward, the, the vision and outcome, what would we imagine that someone watching this could take away from it, and then let's brainstorm some ideas, organize those ideas, prioritize those ideas, and then talk about next steps about what people can effectively do to use these ideas in their own lives. Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, Richard, I, I suspect uh, it's a tall order, but an order that Joe the plumber, the average everyday person, <laughs> right, would would um, would seriously ask and and perhaps think about uh, just exactly um, where in the world. Uh, is he positioned now as a average citizen in the world? Um, does he have a job? Uh, are his children educated? Uh, is there enough money in the family? Is the health services provided for him? And is he happy ultimately? Now, when you look at the United Nations uh, breakdown of happiness of uh, nations, uh, unfortunately, the United States is in the bottom rung of the ladder. So that asks us the question as to what is the present structure of our political economy? What is the uh, present structure of um, our health system? What is the present structure of our educational system? And what is the present structure of our position in the world. I mean, what is it uh, that we ought to be doing or not doing, and what, and some of the issues that rise from there. So I suspect that's the tall order of the evening. Um, we can't be talking about other parts of the world if we are not talking about uh, the United States first. And so I think we need to unravel some of the dislocations within our own society. Well, I can pick up on that. I mean. Uh I think what everyone would probably agree, no matter where they are in their own personal uh, journey towards uh, learning, is that they would probably all agree that things aren't so great right now. And so people are looking for solutions, and it, it seems when people roll up their sleeves and get involved, however that is, whether it's um, the efforts you're making with Tragedy and Hope and a program like this, or they join a political party or become politically active, or they take on a, uh, a uh, philosophy that, that seems to work for them. It, it doesn't take long, I think, before uh, most people, in whatever choice of those types of options they make, they, they, they come to think, you know, this is a tall order to change, to make real change in the type of problems we have, whatever course they take. And uh, we were talking about this before, um, when, when I have people raise that question, and you know, a lot of uh, different commentators raise it or, or ask that, how, this is such a terrible problem, how can we possibly get past it? And uh, you know, it's not something I worry about too much. To me, it's all about uh, bringing people far enough along in their understanding, some would say enlightenment, uh, or waking up, um, however you want to put it, and that you need to get enough people who, um, who understand their world uh, well enough to make change. And so 
that educational process to me, I think, is is simply worthwhile. Whether we can accomplish it in our lifetimes or not, you know, the, 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 the fundamental change that will result from that is an open question. I just don't think it's one that's worth worrying about. You know, you just do the best you can. Well, I think it's important to, to bring people's attention to if you understand that there are problems, if you observe and identify the problems, then automatically our natural response is to bring about change. But there's a step that has, or many steps that have to go on before you can affect change. And that comes in with what you touched on, understanding. And I think I learned a lot about this through reading Chengia's book about learning to understand the environment because it seems like the world kind of catches one off guard if you're born into this place and you're just going about your business and other people have already had predisposed ideas and agendas and corporate profit models that are discriminated against against people as a systematic form. And so I would expect, and I and it was verified when I read Chengi's book, that you have to come to observe that it's going on, identify what's going on, and then you took a lot of steps into understanding how this system of empire, and what you're talking about is the present structure is involuntary. It's not voluntary, and that's what you experienced in South Africa. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to realize these things uh, as a young man? Um. Uh, fundamentally, our educational system, well, uh, let us uh, agree that uh, imperialism and colonialism and globalization, uh, the primary f uh, aim of that education. Now, I, I want to, uh, to, to open this notion of education. Education is taking a a commodity, whatever the commodity is, and using grammar in the most vulgar way to transforming this commodity into that which brainwashes the rest of humanity. In other words, you 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 get your information, uh, not truth, not knowledge not wisdom, that these are what are supposed to be the, the entire collection of uh, human thought, human action, human behavior. But that we don't. We, that, that has been crushed. Instead of that, we have what... Uh, remember also very clearly, we are children of barbarians. What do I mean, uh, children of barbarians? Uh, the Visigoths, the... Uh, and all of the Germanic tribes that came. And look, I'm not talking about you guys. I'm not no, this talking goes about back to Charlemagne Yoga, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. the uh, civilization, civilization of Europe yeah, under the Holy Roman Empire. Empire. Of there course, you, go. you know when my friend um, uh, Alaric uh, of the Visigoths he comes and bangs at the door of the Roman Empire. He said, "Open up, or else." So uh, they said to him from the inside, "What? Or else what?" I'll break down this entire place and and and, and absolutely control them. Of course, they opened up. It's the to patriarch this. of uh, what yeah. modern day Germany. German, is. Yeah, out uh, yeah, yeah, precisely. And he goes along, and then of course, what you find that these barbarian hordes we call them, but they are our grand grand grandfathers who came along, and 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 their warfare, which was their primary goal, not civilization, not all of those things. And whatever civilization that the German, uh, Romans had uh, went by the way. Uh, no, not true. Of course, um, we have another myth that was tied up at that time, and that is Christ. Who, I'm a Christologist. I, I love this uh, this extraordinary prophet of our times. Did you say Christologist? Christologist, a studier of Christ. I've yeah. never heard that term before. But that, oh, yeah. that's yeah, pretty yeah, sharp because yeah. I can dig it. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, when you ask people, I mean, they think of you know the, the Christian Bible, and then you say, "Well, where, where did we get the Bible from?" Well, Christ's words were on the Bible. Then you say, as a as a, a student of theology, it was three hundred and fifteen A.D. You know, the the um, uh, assembly at uh, at Nice. Eh, where I think the, it was three twenty five A.D. Three twenty five A.D. Okay, yeah. But where, the, where the bishops came along and. And, uh, you know, Paul's uh, dictum and uh, Matthew and all of these cats, they got them together and formed the New Testament, which is now 
uh, you know, the Bible of the day. They voted on the Word of God. The Word of God. Uh, that has become the the, the, the earmark. But then, uh, 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 somehow, the barbarians still kind of persisted, and you find that the wars, which the kings and queens used very well, I mean, they really, uh, and the feudal lords. So until recently, we've had a rather difficult education, as you might be, which was information or not the truth. And even to this day, I think philosophers, uh, uh, poets, uh, and thinkers of, uh, are thinking about this particular form. And of course, coming back to the United States, we borrowed heavily from the civilization that came from the West in this part of the world. And we being frontiers people, you know, uh, empire builders have really taken that on and that has become central to our civilization. So the question really is, do we have uh, uh, the knowledge and wisdom? And your Ivy League schools and the Oxford, Cambridge and all of that has been part and parcel in manufacturing consent in Chomsky's terms, you see. So when I when I say education, I was not referring to <laughs> well, formal, not normal well, institutional education. He's referring to an indoctrination system. This right. is why it's important we define our terms. You're referring to schooling in the tradition that the empires have used it for crowd control. When we say education, we're talking about the unocculting or the unhiding of useful information. So Tom, let's go to you. How would you define sophism and contrast that to philosophy? Because from my perspective, they had two very different goals. And this gets back to what Chengi is saying about knowledge and wisdom versus the information that they're they're giving to you in order to make you an interchangeable part. Well, you know, I, I'm not sure um, what you're looking for in terms of sof When I think of sophism, I think of using logic to obscure the truth. Okay, so... Um, that's what I'm talking about as well, because it comes from uh, the, the Greek word Sophia, yeah, which means yeah, wisdom, yeah. but then they, they, it's a misnomer uh, because I mean, they're basically arguing right. uh, anything arbitrarily for money instead of looking for the truth, which is the love of, of truth, philosophy. All right. Okay. So, I should, yeah, <laughs> I, I forgot that, I forgot that uh, uh, source of, uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, the, the, the power structure is invested in in creating mythologies and hiding you know the truth from uh, the the people who are being governed and so when I say that you know to affect real change we need to raise you know may, in education is probably a, a bad term because of the connotation of institutional education which is counterproductive when it's run by the powers that be so you know, some people use the word enlightenment, so or, or awakening. Uh, that whatever whatever it takes to get um, outside, you know, to get beyond the mythologies that are taught in the institutions, and and those institutions can be formal education, religion, uh, the, the media, the political system, and so forth. Um, yeah. Okay. Tom, I think we have a major problem here. And the major problem is we have a system in place, a system that is as old as history itself, and the system of power. In other words, that what very simply now by Occupy Wall Street, I think they've summarized it, 1% owns 99 percent of the world's power. It's been like that through history. Yeah, throughout history, part. but I, I think the 1%, uh, focus on the 1%. And no one, to my mind, so far from the 1% have come along and said, well, you know, we uh, we are not the 1%. I mean, oh, let's challenge this 1% notion. It has taken now that it is true. The second thing, 9-11, I mean, 9-11, I say, 9-11 is certainly operating somewhere. To 99, the 99%. The, 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 the 1%, um, not only have not denied this, but also uh, have uh, have accepted the fact that the people who have uh, made these assertions uh, in all respects, whether it's in law, whether it's in political power, economic power, social power, 
whatever educational power and so on, all of that has contributed significantly. This is the 99% of the 1% I am writing about to say that we all, and, and, and today's discussion is how do the 99% recognize that every morning when we get up and to go to work or school or to the temples, whenever we go or to the uh, money markets, that we are contributing to the power of the 1%. And so in order for us to dismantle this, which we have to do so that civilization flowers again, which is our responsibility, you need to take on your local institutions, you've got to take on, I'm talking about things like the police and the school educational system and the um, health systems and all that. You've got to take on the province or what do you call them here, states. You've got to take on the state, the big state, the United States of America. And you've got to take on the system, which certainly the United States at the present time with the G8 nations or, uh, hold the monopoly. Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, when you, when you frame it like that, okay, um, people can think, well, gee, it sounds like you're talking about, you know, open rebellion. All oh, right. indeed, I'm talking about it. I can tell you that. Well, I see, <laughs> and, I, and I, think, I think that's intimidating for people or it can put them off. And I, and I actually don't think it's necessary, okay, because they have created a mythology that if it fails... They're in trouble, okay? And part of that mythology is that, you know, a self-rule and self-governance of the people. Swaraj. Swaraj. Yes. Okay. So, so, if, so they're, they're sort of bound by their own mythological construct, okay? And if that construct fails, I think that's a problem. So if the people simply, you know, woke up and rejected the political system the way it exists now. That is, the two these two parties, and they rejected the message from the mainstream media. I mean, I mean, these are all things I've done. Okay, I rejected those parties. I stopped getting my information from the you know the the mainstream media, uh, and, and their information sources. I I completely had, you know reeducated myself. I've given up you know the 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 indoctrination in their mythologies. If this were done on a wide scale, they're in trouble. I mean, because the police are part of, I mean, you know, they're indoctrinated into that mythology. And, and basically, once the populace on a large scale says the emperor has no clothes, then when they try to pretend that they have clothes, people are just going to laugh at them. And, the, and, the, and, and their power... Then they're, and if they then try to say, well, this was all a, 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 um, a hoax, and now we're going to impose real force, that's, I don't think that's easily done, because the people who have to do that are people who bought into a mythology that then has disappeared. So how do you, you know, they indoctrinate these soldiers and police into you know, patriotism and, and moral superiority and all these things. And if those things become... You're describing the conditioning that, they, that goes through for all those, whether it's uh, TSA or the police or our soldiers. What you're describing is a revolution needs to take place. Now, if you go to the definition of a revolution, it's a turnabout. I argue that it's a turnabout of the mind and that all these things you described on your fingers, Chengya, they all have a commonality insofar as how we view these things, how we contribute our energy to these things, how we communicate to other people, and whether or not we go on voting even though we don't believe in it, well, that lets everyone else around us think that it's okay to vote your friends and your neighbors into prison inadvertently because of this, the, the way the system's set up. Right. So I think that you're hitting on positive aspects, you're hitting on positive aspects, and it's only through the combination of these individual ingredients to figure out. What is it? Because armed rebellion cannot work in our society because we are like the largest employer in the world is the Defense Department. They 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 say they employ three million people, but there's more than six or seven million people on national security secrecy. So they are all on the contract, and that's how you would keep a secret. And when by the you way. do that, you play into their strength. Okay, which is precisely why, you know, when there is a popular movement and it is a threat. 
you know, one of the one of the the uh, favorite methods of dealing with it is to infiltrate it and and put in people who will engage in promoting in violence, be, right? Violence and agent uh, yeah. provocateur. Right. Right. Yeah, but look, tried and true guys, method. Right, true. Uh, I uh, I think sometimes we take a narrow view, and I want to take the broad view. So take it. The broad view is. Uh, for the, the basic question tonight is how do we change history? I mean, how, how do we challenge? How do we prevent history? it from repeating when we can learn from it? Right. So, firstly, some of us have, are learning. I don't say we have all learned, but learning is one thing, walking the walk is the other. And so, we have a lot of people here who are learning the learns. And then by the time they get old, they die. And so they learned the learn and they died. <laughs> now the working of the walkers. There are several active groups in our society which are engaging in a, a similar or perhaps the same goal that we are. There are people, you know, women are complaining about injustices. The Latinos are all of these people who are victims to state repression, mm. who are victim to the institutional repressions of the state, no matter how benevolent they are, each one of them want to participate in this revolutionary change. When I use the word revolution, I'm not using it in terms of violence only. I'm using it in the broadest sense of the term. So we have to absolutely First of all, investigate who these people are that in our society. What are these groups? What are their aims? Where are they? And sometimes you find, like perhaps you and I are doing, and perhaps uh, um, our friend Richard, that we are supporting several uh, organizations that are participating in the social change. It's broad. For instance, uh, for viewers at home, someone might be uh, interested in 9-11 or uh, the, the GMO yeah, is, foods is, or Occupy Wall okay. Street, and they would be at different sites trying to research each of these individual angles instead of just learning how to learn and become uh, more literate in these areas beyond what they're presenting us with the information. Right. And, and remember, whilst we are engaging in the social change, the government or the state or the system is has endless sources of wealth being poured in every day. Now, if you understand the CIA, better still, if you understand Mossad, Mossad is the most effective, not political organization, it is, it is the most effective... Disinformation. Power, a powerful political institution. Well, I mean, Mossad's uh, motto is to wage war through deception. Uh, and that's that's what, the first rule. Yeah, but whatever. I mean, whatever means, by whatever means, I think uh, one of the, uh, uh, who is this black film film producer? You Spike know? Lee. Spike Lee, by whatever means. I, 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 think, I, I, well, I was a, it was a good guess. <laughs> There's many. Uh, right. Uh, uh, CIA. I mean, of course, the Mossad, somewhere in a book I read, called the CIA a bunch of clowns, you know, too bloated, uh, KGB, the same old stuff, MI5, and so on. But all of them have a, a number of uh, subdivisions. Sure. Today, Obama, or yesterday, Obama said, I will give permission to kill terrorists and anybody we think uh, are unacceptable. Uh, for the President of the United States to say, to take upon himself, uh, we have a constitution, and we have lawyers like you, my dear friend, who said, <laughs> what do you call this process? You know, due process of law, eh? And there it is, the president decides if he thinks that the pope tomorrow is a threat to us, <laughs> system that he can, no. Uh, if, well, you know, they're just being more upfront about that. That's been the uh, open oh. policy. In fact, I was watching a documentary where they had a, a declassified document where Eisenhower says to the head of the CIA, I think it was Dulles at the time, mm -hmm. that the elected uh, Democratic leader in the Congo, that he's got to go. 
Yes. Oh, Lumumba. Uh, Lumumba. Patrice Lumumba. Oh, so yeah. this so, was around 1963. So this yeah. this this is an example of what you're describing, but what they what they're also saying is that they want to dissolve the legal restrictions. I mean, you know, when if it's illegal, you just have to do it um, covertly and quietly. Um, that's inconvenient sometimes, I think. So there, it seems as though they're 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 working towards lifting the legal restrictions, so it can be done more openly and brazenly. That's exactly what they're doing. They're making it so that uh, people aren't so shocked because they're like, oh, well, they passed this law or they passed this order. But when you get down to it, like the Lumumba case is, is fascinating because what you have is that the the CIA wanted to uh, to kill Lumumba because he's a threat. He might make friends with the communists, and we can't have that. So uh, they send in Sidney Gottlieb, who is in charge of the M MK Ultra project, right? Diplomatic pouch, and they give him this. Uh, uh, they have this. Uh, I think it's a poison that they were going to try to give to him, but that didn't go through. And what they ended up doing was hiring revolutionaries mm -hmm. from his own country mm -hmm. and paying them off. And, and then they used that model again and again and again. And they already used it in uh, in Honduras and uh, and well, Iran in 1953 when mm -hmm. they overthrew Mossadegh. Yeah, and then of course uh, we get this uh, again when uh, Kissinger agreed to get Pinochet. Installed and uh, I, I and they killed. Uh, and so, now the question really is: uh, Are we American citizens allowing this kind of arbitrary when we believe in the rule of law? Law is sacred and sacrosanct. Where, why is it that I don't get an objection from the legal fraternity in this country to say, look? Whatever happens, you are the president. You have no right, even as the head of the army, because... He's actually only the uh, commander-in-chief when we are officially at war. And what we have are non-elected rulers and unsupported wars. I mean, there's a lot. What you're indicating is, why haven't the American people put a stop to this? Isn't there anyone among the 300 million people... Well, there were, there recently was a successful effort under the National Defense Authorization, Authorization Act, Act of 2012. Oh, okay, did. so that's a very recent law that was criticized because it tried to take things a step even further, which these powers that have recently been given to the president to assassinate abroad foreigners was extended to you not only uh, to United States citizens but also you know domestic. Right and right here here in this country, so they don't have to wait for you to leave. They can right, right, can and uh, it included right? um, you know uh, no right of habeas corpus, uh, you know indefinite detention, you know and treatment. Checking, you laugh time. because why? You've seen it before. You've yeah. seen it happen in South Africa, and you. <laughs> so this was challenged in the courts, and it was taken uh, uh, to. Uh, the federal court in New York. In Southern a, District of New York. Very recently appointed judge. I don't remember the judge's name, but I know who which judge it wasn't. Uh, it was, it was, it's a it was woman. a female judge. Yeah, yeah. and uh, she... Well, and, and and the way the story is told, if you can believe what you read in the... Law press, journals. And yeah. yeah, it was that, um, you know, it, it was brought... The, the, they, they, they tried to... You know, the, one of the things, one of the challenges when you attack on these laws, you have to show, there's this thing called standing, where you have to show that this is not a hypothetical claim of yours, that you that have a exists. real injury. And so they got people as members of the media, one, one fellow had, I think, won the Pulitzer or something, but uh, they, got, they got these guys together, and, and it says giving aid to terrorists. And they said, look, if I go over there, as I've done before, and, and interview one of these people and report what they say, I could be, uh, that could be interpreted as my giving aid, and I can be locked up, blah, blah. And this potential is putting me in fear of doing my job, and it inhibits First Amendment free speech type rights. And the, what was reported is the judge was initially skeptical, except she put it to the government lawyers. She said, well, you, it's not your intention to use the law in this fashion, right? 
and they wouldn't on the record. Con- on the record, on the you record. want me to answer that? Uh, uh, yeah, they wouldn't. Con- they wouldn't concede that. Yeah. Uh, so that that's when she said, "Well, that's fine." So it's it's it's, it's illegal. On. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Well, we were, we've just discussed the area of law. So there were lawyers who brought that case, and they did make. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and also, uh, you know, just to, to defend the, Shakespeare, the profession. What he said about uh, <laughs> well, what was the context of that? Right, Merchant of Venice. Venice. I I, I, I I need to track that down because I seem to recall that the context of that statement is if you're going to impose tyranny the first way to you do need it. to get rid of you need to get rid of the lawyers who yeah. who are going to try to stand up and defend rights so you know when you had what was happening in Guantanamo okay so they're they're using torture to prosecute these defendants they're give, you know, they're, they're not giving them information they're doing all these terrible things and some of the prosecuting attorneys said no. Some. Right. Well, you see, my problem is again, where, uh, who is who's the uh, well, attorney you, general? You find saints for me and uh, all The attorney in general in of the United States now? No, 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 at that time. Uh, at that time. Uh, Janet Reno. No, 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 no. No, no, no. That was a guy. Oh, uh, it was a Bush Chinese, guy. It was um, um, uh, Ashcroft. No, no, no. It was uh, McCasey, I think. Who, who, uh, Michael McCasey. McCasey. Whatever it is. I mean, well. Then, he, Bush sort of changed attorney generals like uh, yeah, underwear almost. Yeah, yeah, I was say. It, 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 it was um, Ashcroft, Gonzalez, McCasey, Gonzalez, and, they, and then there was, was someone it. after that. I see. Anyway, uh, very quickly, uh, they decided that um, it was okay to torture them. I mean, you know, that, that that's a thing that... I'm not sure uh, the attorney general said Well, then, I think it goes from the Patriot Act, yeah. and it does go all the way up through Alberto Gonzalez's Gonzalez, office. Oh, it Gonzalez, says, that's right. And, and yeah. In fact, if you read their documents, they, at least in uh, foreign theaters, yeah. they are allowed to torture parents and torture the children in front of the parents okay. by pouring battery acid in their anus. To make the parents confess, and at that, that point, parents will say anything. Yeah. So it's not a reliable form of getting knowledge, is it? But but, but the bar- bar- barbarianism, and, and and the other was that a hypothetical that was put? To I don't think that's a hypothetical, but, uh, but I am going to. Because I, I I thought someone was trying to push the envelope on on it. Uh, they push the envelope all over the place, and they they it's all yeah. in writing. They they write this stuff down. It's in the memos but, in the national security documents. But what we argue, and the average Joe the plumber, that this, some of these things hit the roof, as it were, a large amount of these, when you look at the brutalities of our soldiers in Iraq, imagine somebody coming to your door at midnight, if you're a Muslim woman, coming along, kicking your door, you know, brutalizing your children, raping you, shooting your husband. That kind of scenario and racism to a core, because would you go and do it in a white country? You won't. So when are our people here going to say this is a really racist issue? You know, is it? Well, is it yeah, not? Part, you know, and and that 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 raises the question: Could they ever pull this off in this country? Okay. And so before you go on to that point, yep. there was a movie in 1984 called Red Dawn. It was actually one of the first PG-13 films in this country. They're remaking it, and they were going to have the Chinese instead of the Russians, because it was during the Cold War back then, but they're going to have the Chinese come in. Now imagine sleeping in your house, having Chinese troops come around and wake you up, just like you described, mm. speaking foreign language, and they're, they're yelling, and you can't understand what's going on. That's exactly how they would do it, because they wouldn't want people who spoke English to indoctrinate and to police their own mm. their own mm. people. And this has been the example again and again and again over the world, all over the world. And what we find is they're just bringing it home, and you know, the chickens are coming home the roost. Yeah, because and then it's you hard call, to get your own. And then you call yourself Christian. Come on, man! I, this is this is this. You know that, that 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 it seems that that, that you know uh, that's never been a problem for war. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the conflict comes up. The, the hypocrisy comes up when there's Christians that aren't supporting people in Palestine. Because what do the Palestinians ever do to anybody to lose their land and have? Uh, it's not. It's the British government. It's the American government. It's the German government. Mm-hmm. There's all sorts of uh, of pieces that go on there, but. The, the Middle Eastern conflict goes back. I mean, it has quite a history. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here. Of course, no, no, no. I, I did some work on it. And, and really, it's, it's the funny thing about those people who are living in Palestine and is, well, Israel at the moment are uh, Semitic. The people who are accusing or brutalizing them 
are not Semitic. They are Ashkenazi yeah, Jews. Th- th- that's just a very... They're Europeans. Uh, they are Europeans. Yeah. Anti-Semitic is a very abused... But no, but as soon term. as you take the term, the average, not Joe in the street, but the average, uh, what, whatever his name is... Political he, pundit? No, no, no. Well, let's face it. That, that term has are... been changed to mean anti-Jewish or anti-Israel, not even anti-Jewish. No, but it's anti-Jewish. Anti-Semitism is anti-Jewish. And although anti-Israel, I mean, 99% people who are anti-Israel, not anti-Jewish, but if you are anti-Jewish, you are anti-Semitic. Right. That's the, the ruling ethic. Right. Now, right. just for Semit- some context. The, the Palestinians would be Semites, Semitic people. Right. And the in the the Israel was largely populated by European Jews, and they're not Semitic. So right. it's it's an entirely they didn't misused. want to move to the, 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 the desert either. They were financially incentivized to move there and to colonize that area. And what you find in the 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica is when I looked up the word Semite, it said an Arab. <laughs> so when you know, so that's literally what it says. And yeah. I have photocopies of it. And so when you when you go into it, I mean. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding around world events, and then it's question, you know, question: Why can't we have peace in the Middle East? Well, first, no one's defining their terms, and when you read Haaretz, and it says that they created Hamas yeah. and they created Hezbollah, yeah. right? right, as right. as part of their deception, yeah. so they can have controlled conflict. That's the same thing that we use here as model of uh, false flags for democracy, at least for the past sixty years. Yeah, the Middle East is a is a is nobody a, said is it, it's you're right you're right but like hey I'm sorry you it's, started off by saying we have to solve issues here but uh, we, we, but this issues we here, have to understand country, what's going on first well, you yeah. have to you have to be just right. you know you can't be you can't be just just when it suits your purposes okay we have to be consistent okay, right you know you're you're either you either you, you mentioned the rule of law. You're either which 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 is another way of saying you're not a hypocrite. You know you, you, that you apply principles equally to all. You know, yes. ir, irrespective of race, creed, color, national <laughs> origin. Uh, and we've Wait. never done this. Let me ask you this question: Can you have rule of law without threat of violence or force? In other words. Through history, my observations have been, if you want to take over a country, you take over its military because that's how you enforce law. I think there's a clever Latin phrase, but I don't remember it off the top well, of my head. Well, I, I, I can give you a, an example where that wasn't the case. Where it could be uh, voluntary, where everyone has agreement. Well, no, no. I mean, uh, you say you take over a country, you take over their military. We didn't take over the Native Americans' military. We just no, that, that's true. I was I mean, speaking gen- more of CIA also coups a, in the last sixty years. I should have framed it out a little bit better. But that's an astute observation. No, but they didn't have a military as such. I mean, they got together. They didn't need one. They were they were living along. Of course, they had a small uh, set of uh, warriors. Well, uh, look, it, it's it depends what you want to do. I mean, you know, when we when we. We don't like the policies of the elected Iranian representative. We don't really want to occupy Iran. We just want you're speaking the policies. about Ahmadinejad. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So uh, we, you know, uh, whereas you know, in the United States, we were col- you know, that we were taking it over. We were colonizing it, and uh, so it's two yeah. different things. No, but what has he done or that country done to you guys? Nobody. Here? We they, we just wanted the resources. That's what it, you know, and that's that's what. Imperialism and colonization is. I mean, Britain and the United States have been trying to colonize Iran since the Anglo-Iranian mm-hmm. oil company, mm-hmm. yeah. and then it, they brought in the Shah, right? And mm-hmm. then they had they overthrew the Shah. You had Ayatollah Khomeini and the revolution in 1979, mm-hmm. uh, the October Surprise, they called it. Mm-hmm. Nah, I learned my but history. But I, I, I think then. I think there are certain lessons that they're learning. Okay, and and one Who's of them learning this, the powers that be. The okay. Persians or the the the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the ruling class, the ruling class. All right. Okay, exactly. you learn that occupying you you want resources. It's difficult uh, and p- perhaps co- you know too costly and inefficient to to conquer the nation, occupy it with a different race of people. Okay, look what happened in India, um, and. and you know that that's that's hard to do, and it's unnecessary. All you have to do 
is is bribe the locals, right? As we did in Libya. Well, we did. Well, that's now that's a formula that's worked repeatedly. Yes. I mean, we did we did it in Honduras, Nicaragua. Uh, Those are Iran. all Bernays plans, and the recent ones, uh, uh, Egypt, Libya. Syria, all these uh, yeah. color revolutions are, are, yeah. are in mach machinations, is that the word? Machinations. Of Gene Sharp, who lives in Boston. He's a guy who wrote a book about uh, how, to, how, to, uh, how to start a revolution, mm -hmm. something like that. And it's the model that's been used all over the world. And it's basically this hundred and some steps. And if you go through these hundred steps, it's like the new way, it's like the, the proper way to ask for a new government. So if you go through these steps, uh, theatrical as it may be, right. this is the proper way, and then they will send in uh, the Western powers and corporations to fund the Al Qaeda mm -hmm. in your area, and then you can depose your uh, right. Your I mean, government. and uh, you know, I would analogize that to you know evolving from um, you know in your face slavery to you know debt slaves or yes, or, okay, or you know, tr you know in your face tyrannical or. M um, monarchical rule to democratic rule. Yeah. I mean, there are just more advanced forms of accomplishing the same thing in a more efficient fashion, largely due to, to the mythology and myth. You can you, know, you can you can create the the different methods message which Bernays, of course, was well, the, what you're hitting on is the the uh, the synthesis of drapetomania which is the willingness or the desire for a slave to be free uh, with this, this other thing. And how, how would I say it? Uh, it's like what Bernays did. Uh, it's uh, Stockholm Syndrome, mm -hmm. where we have fallen in love pretty much with our oppressors. And we are not uh, ex explicitly enslaved through chains, but it's done through debt slavery. It's done through ignorance. It's it's done. Frederick Douglass said, "If you want to make someone a slave, you take away their ability to reason and to recognize contradictions." And I think he tipped off a bunch of ruling class white people that they could just do that to everybody if they took away our ability to reason and take away the recognition of contradictions. Yeah, but my my question though for you is, does the average yeah, Joe the plumber, Joe the plumber, and Joe the plumber's wife? <laughs> And his Jane, uh, and Jane Plummer, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, Jane, uh, uh, and their children who watch the television and somehow get a glimpse of what we are doing around the world. How do they feel about women starving, women being raped, children starving? Or do we suddenly they turn get the channel? It's a level of consciousness. <laughs> that is not being internalized. Because let me tell you what I saw last night, Chengye. Uh, most talented in Britain, this TV show, these two dogs, like a dog won it, not a person, okay? I, I've seen more like uh, irrational, stupid things being done by human beings in the last 24 hours. And this is what they're putting on TV to dumb everybody down. I mean, there's just one stupid thing after the, like you cannot believe, I would show them during the show, but it would dumb you down so much that I, I can't even touch it. But the point is, uh, all of our media is being uh, superficially mm -hmm. watered down in a contrived way. They're doing this on purpose to keep us from having these feelings and, and empathizing because what does it take to connect with someone on the other side of the world who may not dress like you or might speak a different language? You have to connect with them as a human being. Well, that's one of the basic needs. They, they need air, they need water, they need food, they need security, uh, they, they need to be free. Mm -hmm. And if, if someone else isn't getting those sort of things, it, you have to process that, right? People in America, I think, are just looking for drama and stimulation, and they don't want to internalize deep questions like that and actually think about what it means that when you buy a new iPad, you're contributing to people jumping off of buildings in China, and they have suicide nets to keep these people from killing themselves, and I don't need anything that bad, right? And so there are all these things that are going on that people need to know about in order to take informed action. But what you're describing is the dynamic that purposely prevents people from getting that nutritious information. Well, I think part of the mythology that they create is the um, helplessness of solving certain problems. One of them being, you know, is that, you know, we have all these terrible and awful things happen, and they say, well, government's just incompetent, you know, and people just come to accept that, you know, well, uh, 
we just we'll try then we'll try to do better the next time but these guys just keep messing or this it is up. always how it's been or there's nothing we can do well yeah or the, the, oh. the poor that you know that you see you know the the, the aid the commercials scenario. with the flies in the right. baby's eyes and they think well that's always going to be there you know it's not a problem you can well, solve. there's a greater problem i think the, the greater problem is that we have two governments the one superficial government of the top mm. and the mafia below yeah. who is involved in your drug trade is involved in your women trafficking was involved in all the other corruptive activities well, all over the world. I mean, uh, starting from Washington in control. Now, there's a book called In, in Banks We Trust. Sure. Penny Lernhall, where she talks about the gathering of the clan in Washington, the mafia, the, uh, the banker to the pope, uh, who is a pope, pope at the present moment, uh, the c drug cartels, the bankers, the child trafficking. The I mean, there, is this, it's a finite planet. planet. Yeah. So there is there is the centrality. We're not talking about conspiracy or whatever it is. We're talking about the one percent, and I think the one percent must be exposed for what they are. And I think Occupy Wall Street has made that the central theme. The other is that it is Occupy Wall Street that said. Uh, Wall Street as the primary uh, uh, pivotal role that it plays in keeping the power structure, the economic structure, and so on intact. Now, there are, uh, I've been reading over the years and teaching this thing that there are any number of institutions across the country, groups of people, you know, local televisions, whatever you not. So there is a consciousness on, on at the grass level, although. The uh, your, your patriotic act one act two uh, uh, almost turns everyone here to a minor terrorist. As a matter of fact, I also think that the CIA has its own terrorist branch. They operate at various levels. They kill people. They uh, threaten people. Whatever it's called. There's a whole lot of other agencies here which are part and parcel of this uh, system, and all of these must be exposed as we understand them. I mean, we're in, involved in the media, we expose the media to say, who are these people uh, who are, in fact, uh, legitimating the immoral acts of our people and our government? Uh, the lawyers or the doctors, I mean, the, the medical services and the hospital services are atrocious. For a democratic society, as ours, the military budget is over a trillion dollars. It's totally irrational. And what you're describing is that people lack intellectual self-defense, and thus that single root cause manifests in many different types of symptoms. <clears throat> many of uh, you, you, you referred to several, but you could go on and on. It's not just the the woman trafficking or the child trafficking or the the arms dealing or the drug dealing. I mean, it's it's being done by a ruling class, which is small and thus because it's such a small one percent how does it survive through time well it has to be superiorly organized and be in, uh, in a superior form of communication with less entropy than the rest of us who are who are good people and not necessarily thinking out like you have to really learn some history before you can comprehend the depth and breadth of evil that and what I mean is irrationality that can be engaged in when people can't defend themselves intellectually and it, and it proliferates. Yes. Uh, within the universities, I've been teaching at several universities, several courses, and uh, uh, some of the most um, I feel pained when I see the thinking of some of these characters. I mean, I wouldn't have them in any play I have. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the greed for money, the greed for travel, the greed for research. And so I asked some of these professors, research what? Research imperialism, research, uh, uh, you know, 300 years of uh, execution of innocent people. Crowd control, that's what they're all researching oh, under well, one guy. There's, there's only so much money in challenging the man. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if, if professors, we are here as harbingers of truth, 
I remember going to a university, one of the professors was telling me, you know what, you come here to learn the truth, nothing else. If anybody else is here for something else, get out of this seminar. Now, is that no, Na- Natal? Is that the Natal? No, 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 no. This is right. the high school. All right. No, no, this was the university. Surprisingly, it was in Oxford. Oh, right. But this guy was a friend of mine, and, and he, he he was involved with it. Well, there's there's plenty of blame to go around. I mean, what what about, I mean, you're certainly, lawyers could stand up more. They, they have their O's. The doctors, I mean, what about the doctors who... You know, check these guys who are being tortured to make sure, you know, they, <laughs> they can yeah, continue yeah. being tortured. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't do that. And and then, of course, the pe- and then the journalists are completely sold out by and large. I mean, I- if they have ethics, they're gone. That's and, that, and then, yeah. but, but that's just it. I mean, there's now, an, an, you know, an alternate media, which is what it's all about. You know, the, the other issue is one of, um, that often comes up, is to what extent do you support people taking baby steps along a path. I mean, you know, you mentioned Occupy Wall Street. I mean, that, that movement has identified some, it, it seems to identified some important issues, but that's, they're, they're, they're in an early stage of understanding. As a large group, you know, it's obviously different among different individuals. Tea Party is much worse off. So. Well, the substance of the Occupy Wall Street comment, uh, in my opinion, is uh, you know, edified by the fact that you don't occupy anywhere going into a winter. Napoleon proved that. Hitler proved that. <laughs> I mean, you can't. You know, that's if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, right. you don't occupy any place in a winter, even if it's Occupy Wall Street, because you saw what happened. People got frozen out. And they pulled out. So, I mean, it is. It's a or thing. swept out by the cops. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. Pepper spray. But there's a level of consciousness. Uh, you'd agree with me. There's a level of consciousness that one would say tipped uh, the balance a bit. I mean, you know, it is. It was. It, I was very gratified about that movement. Yeah. I mean, we 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 had we had our program in uh, you know late November December of 2010, and I would never have predicted that less than a year later you had this movement. You know, where we were talking about Wall Street and the, the being a source of power and being, you know, a source of control and being above the two political parties and all this sort of stuff. And here this movement pops up, sort of, you know, mm-hmm. capturing that. I, so I, I, I think that's wonderful. You know, another source of, of controversy is like Ron Paul. And um, I, 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 if I see someone who I think who's a Ron Paul supporter, and there's a lot of young people who are, and I see that they were here and that they've gone there. I'm not going to dissuade them from that uh, because I well, think it's it part is. of the, the, the learning and the discovery of the trip is uh, going from one thing to another as you learn and saying, I outgrew this. It, it's, it's about are you still learning? Are you making progress? Right. Are you getting any place meaningful? Because we don't all just uh, you know come out uh, a priori and have these ideas. We have to go through a process of learning through cause and effect and experience. And uh, I mean, I think those people will experience the rejection of the Republican Party, the rejection of the mainstream media, and and, uh, and a lot of his, you know, he has a lot of good ideas in terms of war and foreign intervention and so forth. So, no, you, 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 you. The question really for us is, do we do we support them? And, and I remember when the nine eleventh, did it nine eleven? Yes. Um, there was a the socialist party here you know, on the campus said, you can't support this because they are... You mean you can't support questioning the 9-11 mythology? Uh, missile <laughs> thing because um, there's a particular fellow who stood for president, and I can't remember, you know, he's... Uh, 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 John Kerry? No, yeah. no, some guy... Um, Michael Badnerick? No, he had his his people in airports. I remember when I first traveled. Okay, whatever. Oh, was it was he was he um was he one one of the political parties? Who who's the little squirrely guy? Kucinich. Kucinich? No, 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 no. <laughs> the same he communicated though. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> that uh, that this part. I'm just, but the propaganda. The this is the other thing, is that the ruling. Um, the ruling crowd have have mastered the idea, the, the notion of deception, lying, cheating, killing, 
uh, prostituting. And they've mastered the idea of getting us to be conditioned to believe it without questioning. Precisely. That's two halves of it. Right. You know, the, the, the most, ex I'm sorry, the most extraordinary thing is, the, is and, and the, the amount of people who believe this, and the amount of intelligent people who believe this, that, oh, I got to vote for this bad guy because otherwise I'm wasting my vote. Right. <laughs> Right. The lesser of two evils is, is still... Well, evil. it's mathematically, you know, a joke. I mean, one person is not going to <laughs> decide on... The thing. steering wheel is not connected to the wheels on, on the car. I mean, you can you can turn this wheel all day. You can vote for whoever. The Electoral College is, has always ensured that it's rigged. And now that they have control over the electronic mm -hmm. voting, now that they have control over the exit polling, they have control over monopolizing reporting on it, and they can make someone like Ron Paul... Just completely disappear. Well, you can still, if you had the right numbers, you could eviscerate that system. Okay, you could just eviscerate it by understanding it for what it is. But can you get through the machinery or the the machine? Well, I'll tell you what I tell people. I say, look, who do you really think would be the best? Or or, or do you think I go? Here's how you, you should vote: as though every other person in the country voted the way you voted. That's how you should vote. Okay. Yeah. Now let me ask you this: Would you let someone that you don't know, who you might have read a couple paragraphs about or whatever, make decisions on what you have for dinner every night? Because I wouldn't outsource my de my decision for dinner, let alone to have someone voting on. My, I don't believe in the whole voting thing mm -hmm. that someone else is going to make a better decision for me than I can for me. Well, I understand that. That's the whole. They purposely thing. try to create a situ situation where that happens. Right. So we we, we, we need a, a rethinking of our political system. Full stop. This democracy and mythologies and so on. The only democratic people in the world, my friend, have been the six nation Iroquois right. from whom from whom we borrowed the notion of democracy. And the constitution. Yeah. Now that must be an education for some people like you guys, but never mind that. <laughs> We've uh, talked about this before. I was just trying to think of what else we could throw in there. No, right no. The, 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 uh, Emil was the secretary of the Dutch East India Company who studied the native people and their political systems. John, John Stuart Mill. Yeah, and he wrote his notions of democracy. The only Democrat that was present in, the, in uh, Greece was um, Socrates. And you know what they did to him? They virtually killed him because he was forced. Actually, him. did you know that when they voted Socrates <laughs> to death, uh, less people voted for him to be put to death but after, like, the point is, the type of death, mm -hmm. the way he reacted mm -hmm. after being put to death, ever, almost everyone voted for him to be uh, put to death a certain way, exactly. you know, as far as the penalty. So uh, he was guilty. He, it wasn't decided that he was put to death. And then because of how he, he said, what, they said, what do you think your punishment should be? He said, oh, I think you guys should uh, buy me dinner every night. And they're like, well, we don't like that. He's going to get death. So more people voted for Socrates for the death penalty than voted him guilty. Because they didn't like the rhetoric of how respond, you know, they, his response was different than their expectations. Expectations. Small lesson there. S anyway, so 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 when we are we sure how, Socrates is a real character? Or was he just made up by uh, Plato? Uh, That's a good question. Uh, and I applaud yeah. that line of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember that question being raised, and I, I've I, yeah. never seen any empirical evidence that Socrates is a real person, but he seems to be very useful for Plato's ideas to be uh, dressed in that fabric. Yes, but I, I doubt that too because I, I, later on when I look at Plato's uh, Republic, I, I have problems with it. It looks like the caste society in India. Anyway. It does look exactly like the caste society in Anglia, India. Thank right, you. Right. So, so let's um, apart from that. Look, we have people who who are going to follow and humble enough to follow, but we need to decide here in this crucial period of our history. Terrorists have all been constructed, paid by, organized by the CIA. Yeah. Then some of the terrorists themselves have been formed, uh, you know, encouraged by these terrorists who apply, given them money, send them around the world. To, then there are other agencies that have supported this because it's a wonderful thing. Now that the uh, communists are not there, we need to utilize this force very good to go and bomb afghanistan uh, iraq iran why because we want the oil 
we can't wage this war otherwise. We say these are terrorists. And of course, there is a, a small terrorist group somewhere, but it's insignificant compared to the terrorists we have created. Now, we need to understand that the average American would say, what? The, this is nonsense. You know, it's more than just getting the resources. The, 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 it, it's become an organizing oh. principle of, yeah. of oh. a society, the, uh, you know, a military... Uh, well, of the British know, society so specifically. Precisely. And so, well, certainly. Well, we've out we've outdone the British. Well, now. we 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 are on the British model. We're on the Cecil right. Rhodes model, just like Israel's on the Cecil Rhodes model as well. <laughs> Welcome back to history, so it doesn't repeat. We have been learning how to question a system that is proven to lie. We've been talking a little bit about education and indoctrination and people's loss of volition through time as you study history coming all the way up to today where you have a lot of people who are outsourcing their thinkings and taking sound bites from TV and corporate mass media and instead of thinking for themselves they're taking these other ideas accepting them adopting them as their own thoughts and beliefs without first checking to see if there's any substance to them. Cheng Ye, in your experience have you ever noticed a pattern of empire depending on these types of tactics or do you think it might be accidental that we're experiencing this? Uh, no. Uh, um, when you begin to look at the research departments at universities, I mean, take for example Skinner's uh, rat behavior, uh, you would find that uh, this has been, you know, systematically studied uh, in in uh, uh, particularly in crowd control, in military control, and and various other psychological profiles of how. Uh, uh, um, uh, the order is uh, given and, and the order is executed and and the framing is done very systematically. So the scientific approach uh, overlaps with the emotional approach uh, and then overlaps with the structure that is there. So um, French philosophers like Darida and all of these people have been talking about structuralism and um, and seeing how uh, none of these things happen in, to in a totality, but rather by divisions. So um, we have uh, certainly within the modern industrial society, we've certainly carved out several divisions within various social sciences. And the social sciences itself is divided artificially into sociology, anthropology, and what have you not. And we sell these commodities now. It wasn't so bad until, for the last 10 years now, the university courses are now um, um, part of it being the truth being brutalized. Uh, they are sanitized, um, uh, objectified, um, made scientific uh, with all kinds of strategies. And the philosophers, political scientists, economists, and all have come along uh, to make this uh, a part of research. And you've got to understand that each professor that uh, uh, supervises his students must must the students must somehow approximate to the truth as he understands it and as he understood it from and as it's being related within the confines of a university structure. Uh, yes, of course, that in itself is a limiting factor. So, whereas the universities were built to seek the truth. Here, the truth is packaged by the system itself. So your curriculum for the universities and the high schools and so on comes right from the political mentor upstairs. It's and much worse than that. Though. Much worse than that. <laughs> and when I say that... I'm being, be, being sympathetic with you guys. You know? Well, no, no, look. The university is one part of it. But yeah. think about what goes into a person's belief system, okay? And you could, you know, we can really take, you know, all of us have, must have tried, you know, whether it's a family member or a friend, to try to awaken them, right? So look at what you're up against. You know, so a lot of times you're up against 
the, the many trusted figures is what it comes down to. Their parents taught them certain things and believed certain things. Their teachers, and, and, and you know, in 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 uh, grammar school and so forth. Uh, then you know, people uh, in the media who they came to trust, political leaders they came to trust. You know, when you when you try to confront them with a new reality, and you are you're up against all this legion of trusted figures, that is not easy. And you know, uh, giving I'll tell all you, of when that, you mean you've come across the trusted leaders, but the trusted leaders are peddling the same truth. I mean, in other words, well, and not them are peddling it. A lot of them would believe it. I mean, the, 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 the parents could be, I mean, parents can be a major factor in a person's belief system, right. correct? Right. Okay, so, so you know, they learn a certain reality from their parents, they learn it from their teachers, some teachers they, you know, they don't like, but some they did like, then they, they came to like certain political commentators and, 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 and enjoy them and then and start trusting them for news information. And then they, they believed in certain politicians and supported the politicians. And all of these people had a consistent message that they believed in. And, the, and then if you challenge that, you're up against all of these people and or institutions that this person trusts. And you're asking them to abandon all this. And what do you have to balance that? You know, on the, on the, on the scales for this person's assessment of what's real and true how, how do you you know counterbalance what that's a that's a fascinating question because that dynamic goes on with almost everyone i know and i have personal experience with that and so what i would say is it's not an either or in that situation it's an also and and so if you're going to take away the if you're going to show someone that they've built a castle in the air as it were you first kind of have to give them a ramp from the air down to the ground and you do that and say look uh, we have all formed these beliefs, whether it's religious or political or what have you, at an early age before we had time and the methods to go and find certainty for ourselves. So these beliefs are much like placeholders and they exist until you get the opportunity to take the time. So what would replace it would be the actual observation, identification, organization, and communication that would have gone into your earlier decision had you had those methods at an earlier but age. But Richard, people naturally outsource that, okay? You know, people... As a function of our current culture. Well, as a function of practical living. I mean, look at all the things you outsource. You know, uh, my air conditioner needs to be fixed. I outsource that. So I now you're talking about trust. The basis of trust, that's when you outsource something usually to a trusted source. Otherwise, if you're not... If you don't have a certain uh, degree of certainty that the air conditioner guy that you're calling, you're looking for better business bureau or AAA rating or, or what have you. Perfect example is global warming. Okay, when, when That's you, you, air conditioner, you, global you, warming. yeah, you you look at you look I'm at any you, you look at anyone's position on global warming. Okay, nearly none of these people roll up their sleeves and look at the science. They simply where they are on that issue depends upon who they trust and where the people they trust are on that issue, and and it's because they trust those people. And have grown to trust them and, and, and have tested. I mean, people trust not, you know, not, it's, not there, it's not necessarily uh, uh, flippant. I mean, you know, people I'll trust you, people because they pass certain tests for that, those. They should, well, yes. Well, well, what, what are we debating here? Are we, we are saying. Well, I'm saying what, it, what is required to overcome. To wake someone up or to overcome oh, the mythology. I see. Okay. So we accept the fact. That there is propaganda, or whatever. Right, you and you don't it, have to get to the university to be to have, to be fully right. indoctrinated. Okay. Uh, now let's let's look at that. You we do you don't have to go to the university to be fully indoctrinated. But if you get there, chances are the university is going to continue the indoctrination. Well, that's exactly what we said. That uh, yes, there are various agencies. What does the university do? It puts the final stamp mm -hmm. because the university legitimates. You know, you come out of a certain university, well, you're, you know, uh, X, Y, or Z. Certainly the whole entire marketplace 
from your engineer. Or, from or the, you read about them in the newspaper or you hear them on TV. But the the thinking, academic experts are going to be there, even if you don't sit in their classroom. That's true. No, they're going to be there, but the similar kind of uh, political thought, social thought, with slight differences here and there, because by the time the newspaper editors get their commands from the CIA that this is acceptable, this line of thought, uh, you, you know, political articles in this country has to pass the CIA. Uh, Most the newspapers time. probably don't rate the CIA. Uh, uh, well, but, but it, you know, all you, know, you need is national New security. Times, uh, New, yeah. No, national security oh, demands okay. yeah. that you give the, the small stories here and there. Of course, you know, uh, such and so was. Well, killed, let's define national security. National security is something which, if the public knew what was going on, they would say that's not cool. Precisely, you don't want right. the public to know what's going right. on. Similarly, you divide up the curriculum and you pick up bits and pieces and you get your expertise and you get your, and then you go along and you plug in a hole and so the system operates functionally structurally it's like a convection and, current because it's finite you're right and then and the, this is so called objectified because we are not you know where uh, this is a uh, a structure not not something that is um, has soul in life uh, and then, uh, you know, this is the way systems must run. And once that is in place, then you say, well, now what is the challenging force? The challenging force is a consciousness that each one of us carries. That consciousness uh, can be collective consciousness when a group of people get together and say, hey, this is unacceptable. Um, sometimes there are a number of collective consciousnesses that arise out of circumstances, uh, which can coalesce. But nonetheless, there is a, a larger force of the state, i.e. the police, the, um, the national security, and so on, wanting to divide that national consciousness, making sure that group A doesn't support group B, doesn't support, then they send uh, Ajahn provocateurs to begin to divide you any further. Right. They have lots of tactics in their arsenal. Right. Views. Right. Uh, but, you know, well, I, I'm still interested in the notion of, you know, you, your own personal s successes in taking a person who was indoctrinated and flipping them. Because I've talked to a lot of people who, I mean, they can be part of a movement like a 9-11 or something like that. And, and they'll be sitting there and they'll be expounding on, well, here's how we need to do it. And I asked them, have you ever flipped a friend or family member? And they go, no. I go, all right. All right so, <laughs> so how I'm sure you're batting zero. So that's the, uh, that's the recipe that we're seeking to have the ingredients assembled and figure out what proportion of ingredients uh, catalyzes this communication that we're all seeking to have with people. And from addressing uh, what you had to say and what you said, Tom, I think it's a combination of observing that there are myths, using metaphors and story to help people understand these myths and the nature of these myths. And then only through that understanding can we take effective action. Because if you, if you look at the origin of these myths, go back to myths, Greek mythology, uh, what the gods would conquer, they must first divide. So what we're describing all throughout is divide and conquer. And that's what we don't want to happen when we're trying to communicate with a friend, family member, colleague, what have you. And so the way to do that is to never force them with your opinion. We have to learn for ourselves how to ask the questions in the right environment, set and setting, to which it actually provokes their mind and gets them thinking in that direction, it's a very delicate thing to do because what we want to do is communicate the raw facts. And I want to sit down with a stack of documents and say, here is all the evidence and proof. But before people will actually sit down and objectively look through that, they have to overcome, they have to meet and surmount to be motivated their own mental that. obstacles. You have to be motivated. And what's more motivating to any of us than our freedom? Because I would ask you this, if you ask people uh, what their worst fears are, some people might say spiders or snakes or psychopaths or you know gang bankers or whatever. The, the point is, what is the commonality of all these fears? Something could take away your rights. Something could take away your volition. Something could take away your life. 
and whether it's uh, an animal, which is not evil, it might be dangerous because it acts in an irrational way that doesn't have the ability for reason. Or it could be someone who just says, I need another billion dollars and, you know, 100 billion is not enough. Right. And so in all these cases, what you're scared of is losing your life or your freedom or your volition, uh, your health, any of these things with all these problems that we've we've indicated, whether it's uh, the, the child trafficking, genetically modified foods, poisoning the water, poisoning the air, uh, phony economic uh, prospects, uh, phony political actions that are going on and, and counterinsurgency being paid for with U.S. tax dollars. So there's a lot that could be done, but it can never be touched until people get to know themselves, ask these questions, learn to communicate with each other, and then as individuals form groups without the collectivist mentality where you sacrifice the individual to the state. We all have to maintain our individual objectivity and our sovereignty. Yeah. And that's where our rights come from. Now, you people here in the States have a greater problem than perhaps, say, the... Um, uh, uh, Egyptians or uh, our propaganda is more effective. Your propaganda is more effective. <laughs> you 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 um, are easily bought off because every day you want to buy a new set of clothes. We're funding our own slavery in this country, it, it, right? You know, you believe that uh, you know you got a job at uh, McDonald's while you got a job, man. At least, you know, you Or you go that. to college and you have debt. Uh, right. Okay. Uh -huh. Or you have a job and you need to hold on to your health care. Yeah. yeah. I mean, these are the kind of things that um, intimidate people from bucking a system that they have become dependent upon. Uh, because they fear that they would lose their life, their freedom, their health, any of these things. It's all tied together with that irrational notion of fear, which is how they control all of us. There's too much fear in this world. And how do you eradicate fear? You have to observe and identify the knowledge, remove the contradictions, and then that's understanding, that's wisdom, that's how you t transmute the fear into something useful. And that's the same thing I'm trying to say when we communicate with other people. If you can take them on that journey so that they can recognize the fear for what it is. It's something we haven't inspected yet in many cases. I mean, there are other fears that are physical, but well, what I we're think, talking about tonight. I, I think it's very personal, to, to, in my experience, to the individual. And I think and it's a hard thing to do if you don't make a personal connection with the person and are able to discern what's important to them and you know what piece can make a difference to them. But you know programs like this, whether it's a program like this or a book, I mean these are tools that become available. Um, you know maybe someone is a friend of some of Tragedy and Hope and decides to watch a video or just like you can read a book I mean so it, it, it can be a step and certainly it's helpful but you know for any given person uh, and of course if you get them young, younger it's easier uh, but, well that's the the, the, the Jesuits uh, you know if you give me a child before he's until he's seven or before he's seven mm -hmm. you'll have him for the rest of their life and that's yeah. the same thing Lenin said and that's why I was like well, who educated Lenin right uh, the same thing with the uh, Jedi Knights uh, too <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, 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 uh, so so we, we, we've, we've discovered there's a major problem in industrial society. But the major problem in the industrial society as opposed to the non-industrial society is that in an industrial society, you have a, it's a carrot and the donkey. You always fall at, you know, beginning to realize that you would reach the golden age or American dream or whatever it is. So you don't want to give up what you have. Uh, whereas in other countries, there's no carrot in there. You're suffering, you don't have water, you don't have food, and you have military coming in and raping and doing all kinds of stuff where people are ready to make whatever move you're, well, you're using the uh, the analogy of carrot, the carrot and the stick. Okay, right. <clears throat> Here we have the carrot. We're all being incentivized, uh, uh, conspicuous consumption, and right. that's how we're enslaving the rest of the world by Americans falling into this ego uh, central uh, mentality and externalizing our pain to other people. Whereas in third world countries, they don't have the carrot at all. They don't have the clean water, running water, cable TV, Hollywood films, brand name clothes. But, but, they but, just have the stick being used against yeah, them. Yeah, but, but remember. Policy that they had all that they wanted. I mean, there's some things that I try and get uh, to convince the Western listener. That is, somebody said to me, you know, 
before uh, civilization came, Africa was a dark uh, continent, you know. I said, I lived in the dark continent. We, we had a small piece of land and we uh, got the herbs from there. Uh, you know, we worked hard, but we enjoyed our lives and we were happy. And you were self-sufficient without empire and colonialism. Precisely. I said, you know, what gives you the idea that we were not happy? I mean, what is the notion of happiness? Do you think your big house and your car and all that, um, you know, just get out of my country and leave it there and you go, go and live. But no, you want the sugar plantation, for example, from where I come, has contributed the most to the sugar industry in the world. Yeah, they're not there to make you happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not. They might say so. You, you want the, the oil left there. You can't just screw the oil, the gold, the, the diamonds. diamonds. You, know, you know what I mean? Right. The diamonds itself. You know, our wealth has made you rich. And every day you want to become richer. And where do you, you go back looking, can we get some more gold and diamonds and silver and potassium and all of that? They just said there's no such thing as blood diamonds anymore because Israel has cleaned up Sierra Leone's uh, diamond trading business. I see. Yeah, so. How, how did Israel do that? Uh, I, I didn't read the details. I, I wasn't really <laughs> believing the story. I just saw it reported by a reputable source. Uh, of course, how do they do this? Uh, very <laughs> they're easily. they're controlling the market perspective. Uh, precisely. And you... you, you you support all the gangs that are operating there, and they gangs, you know, control uh, areas which are producing gold, diamond, potassium, all these small things. Even that cell phone component comes from one part of the Congo, and right. the Congo is the worst place in the world for rape and, and debauchery uh, run by gangsters, the entire country, unmanageable. But we support them. So, so I'm not leave alone the crime that you are committing in your own country and allowing that to happen. Uh, what we are doing to other countries. I mean, you know, in Iraq now, apparently there's tremendous amount of clashes and what have you not. The Iraqis didn't complain about Saddam Hussein. There's no no report here that the Iraqis were complaining about it. Of course, uh, the reason why Bush said he went there was uh, weapons of mass destruction. That was a lie. So the question is, when do we ask ourselves, what kind of a, uh, a president do we have? What it's an interesting see? observation, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure how much the people... Yeah, when you want to know something, honestly... Uh, one of the strongest features in terms of control in the United States is dividing the people up into the these, rules. these two factions, these two teams, the Democrats, Republicans, sure. or the liberals and conservatives, if you like. And, you know, so if, if you, you take your basic conservative or Republican and you confront them with the fact that the Bush administration lied about WMD, they don't really care because in their mind, okay, if one of their guys did something wrong, that's still not as bad as if the other guys were running things. It's always justified. Right. He's a bad guy, so we framed up some evidence, but he's a bad guy. And, we and, get rid of him. and they'll rationalize. But where did Saddam come from? We put him there in power in 68, helped to overthrow the other regime. He's been a CIA stooge the whole time. And when he stopped. You're talking about the father, yeah. Well, I'm talking about Saddam and oh, and, so I'm sorry. Yeah, Saddam and both Bush Senior and Junior had problems with them. But it's the same thing they did with uh, who's, uh, who's but, the guy but, from but Libya. You know, but you know what it really well, helps? Well, Muammar Gaddafi. Yeah, it's the same thing we do with all those dictators. Noriega, we we propped him up, and then we go in and remove him. Okay, but what, what impact is that going to have? Panama and the thinking of of the person who's who's locked into this you know team mentality among the political. Well, versus. it's about consistency and thinking. So I would first ask them. It's like no, no, no. Yeah, okay, but see, here's here's the, going to be the response. Okay, because and, and and I've heard that this traces to Adam Smith. But first of all, politicians. There, people. We're taught the politicians are lousy people anyway. Okay, so they believe. Well, okay, our, our a lot of our. So if they're if if the government when their people are in power do something wrong, 
well, you know, okay, he's a, well, what do you expect? He's a politician, but theirs are worse, and they have the wrong philosophy. Okay, and the other thing is the government's incompetent. Yeah. So if they do something wrong, well, okay, they screwed up, because, but that's what governments do. They screw up. So we should trust these people who screw up and they're incompetent with nuclear weapons and the wage war without our permission. Well, 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 to, to the person who's indoctrinated this way, what is, what is the alternative? Oh, you know, the, 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 let alone the alternative. I am appalled that civilized people will elect barbarians to Congress and the House of Representatives. In other words, if some guy there goes and supports to declare in a war on another country for false, under false premises, I don't expect this guy from Harvard, Yale, or Princeton to go up this ladder to kiss babies. I mean, I'm appalled. I, yeah, I, but, but, I, but, 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 the, the, but Joe the plumber, you know, just sees this as the way things are. All right, first off, I would explain to Joe the Plumber that Joe the Plumber and everyone else that I know has to interview to get their jobs or they have to have some sort of track record of success. We don't do that for the most important positions of leadership in our country. Precisely. The president doesn't have a, a formal interview, your, your local congressman, etc. And what we're talking about really is integrity and accountability. And it has to be localized. If you don't have local accountability, forget about it, which is why they want to globalize everything so that there is no local accountability. And that's why... Uh, anarchists will argue that there must be a village parliament. In other words, people in the village should decide how that village ought to be run. So the people then, affected we, we, have we, to have say in the decision, we, otherwise we, we, it's not a contract. Yes, and we can all agree on, on right? this. Consideration? We, and a, we, yeah, can, we, can, we can all agree on this. But uh, And I don't know how the, the two of you uh, are in terms of mixing it up with <laughs> Joe the plumber, but I, I recently I've been doing it every day. Okay, I've been debating people who are locked into the system, and I've been trying. I, you know, it, it's tougher because it's been online, so it's not been that personal <laughs> right contact. But you know, I, tr you know, if there is any kind of it, it, in terms of the facts that are available to me, the logic that's available to me, I mean, I've tried it all. Okay, and just for clarification, it the specific interest, the uh, specific instances you're talking about, don't have anything to do with tragedy and hope, and that was on a different site that you're yeah, having yes, these yes. conversations. Yeah, yes, yes, no, no, no. Look, chances are, if someone is is a member of tragedy and hope, they're in good shape. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe you know they join at the suggestion of a friend, and they're not convinced, or they haven't know? gotten gotten the hang of it yet. Because I leave a lot to be realized by the person taking the journey i don't want to tell you all the time what's going on it's a journey you take and it just like life it's kind of there to help you as a micro right so i'm i guess i'm going back to where we started in terms of what it will take to make change and you know and if people you know are mostly watching who think as we do in a lot of these topics but they're going to know a lot of people who who think otherwise right and it's about so, getting through the congregation and let them think otherwise. No, I I flipped a few people, and it, and I've I've and I can't, and there's some others I can't flip. I mean, they should flip themselves though, really. At well, a they do. Point. They they all do. That's oh. the point. That's oh, the key. Oh, I've flipped more people in uh, in, yeah. in my life over the year. I mean, God, every time I address a bloody political meeting, you know, I get these cats getting up and right. so on. And and really, my friend, I'm a nice guy. I speak lovely, and you know, but I can get, uh, I I can, uh, you know what? I, I can be irate. So. No way. I can <laughs> declare war, man, and you know the guy is going to regret after he finishes. Well, I'd look, say. Uh, you know, I I I I that would I would find that impressive. No. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, I I I I see it as a difficult, subtle. You know, I'm talking about, you know, we're not talking about the converted here. No, no, I mean, no. no so if someone shows up at a political rally that yeah. you speak at, and yeah. they're not already well on the way to being converted. No, there were some, of, some of them come very specifically to oppose okay. anything you say. 
uh, and they have a few hecklers. With well, them that, that's too. a very difficult person. How to can turn. they be there to oppose what you say before you speak? Oh, they they they, they haven't yeah. heard what you had to say yet. Yeah, but, well, but, but, but you're being too logical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The reputation is there, and you know what? This guy will go along and straighten him out. Um, I I just remember recently I was in a meeting where ninety percent of them were doctors, you know, and we're talking about the medical system in South Africa. And I said, well, very good, you know. But I said, but what about African medicine? This is Africa. This is you know, uh, allopathic medicine is understandable. Have we have we discussed, you know, some, or are you concerned as doctors that there is a medical system here? Uh, don't tell me about indigenous medical systems, you know. So, you know, hey, you guys uh, inherited the Rockefeller Carnegie medical complex, the same that they rolled out all over the world, right? Allopathic, the allopathic. So. So, of course, some woman, you know, was very upset that there's something called African med. What is that? Is that, uh, does it have something to do with a witch doctor? It's Yes, yes. You know, uh, God, you're going to take all these people on whatever it is because they'll never go and uh, study the stuff in books. They won't go along. They'll just come along and defend their position. No, you're a nice guy, Tom. I, you know, but you don't. Uh, uh, you're going to declare war at some stage. I'm not otherwise. Declare what? I'm sorry. War, war, uh, war. Well, I know. Look, I expect you. I expect you to be ahead of me uh, on conversions. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I don't want to mean, I, I, You just have to state the facts as you see. I'll them. tell you one of them. Just if you want to hear an anecdote, uh, we, we, you know, we lawyers catch a lot of grief, and I and I've I've. In the, in the tragedy, karma. <laughs> in, the tragedy home, in the tragedy home community, I've mentioned Jerry Spence. Okay, as yeah. being a guy who I, I had went to Jerry Spence. Yeah. for my case. Yeah. So the, 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 you're talking about real skills of persuasion, and I used to be a. Uh, I used to like to watch um, uh, Crossfire, Pat Buchanan uh, on the conservative side, and I can't remember the guy on the the Opus Dei guy, Opus Robert. The uh, old guy with the guy with glasses. Uh, uh, not the old guy. There was an older guy, and a younger egghead came in. I can't remember. Tucker Carlson used to no, be no, crossfire. No, no, yeah. James Carville it was before before I those. I stopped guys. watching CNN years ago. So yeah, yeah. That's, it, was that's before, it was before those guys. So, uh, but uh, Spence was on because the the issue was, it was during the Reagan administration. It was when that guy who was the Secretary of Interior who wanted. You know, thought the rapture was going to come, and so you didn't have to preserve anything. Uh, uh, Watts or something like that. Yeah, I don't remember uh, who that was. Oh, okay, that was before your time here, youngster. Mm. But uh, so the question was, get you know, Spence lives in Wyoming. So the question was, giving any lives in a really nice place I've been to, Jackson Hole. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so the question was, like, you know, the government selling drilling rights in this otherwise beautiful park. And of course, you know, Buchanan was taking the conservative position. Spence turned him right there in the program. And it was just amazing because Pat is a very independent, tough minded, uh, strong willed person. But it, so it can be done. But that's the rare I've seen a person who has an opposite point of view turn in that kind of setting you're describing. But yes, yes, I'm sure yes. you have, you have, you know, uh, you know, um, Jedi type, you know, mind control powers there. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, but you, you, you know, you, you go along. I mean, this is a huge crowd. You know, sort of why are you there for you? Well, this, if you're up on stage and they're listening to you, that's I guess you got a leg up right there. You know, yeah, so. then he's got to worry about the guys with batons who come in to break yeah, up anyone listening to him, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which is why they put him under house arrest. Anyway, yeah. Um, so, so. Coming back, I, uh, we have a um, multiplicity of issues that, uh, and a multiplicity of solutions which uh, we uh, have to examine and suggest what we do. And so we sit back and say, well, look, uh, there are uh, strategies are many. It has to be. We, it, it's not one system and one uh, uh, perhaps a philosophy of the state. The state is, is quote, democratic. Democratic in its oppression. In other words, 
its oppression is not, uh, you know, a fundamentalist or perhaps a one direction force like uh, totalitarianism e or fascism. Equal opportunity oppressor? Uh, yeah, equal opportunity <laughs> oppressor. So we've got to work out the strategy or inform the general public that first of all, they must seriously examine every proposition that comes from the media, from the state, from, from any sources that tell you that this is the direction to go. This is how you're going to solve your problem. Uh, you know, I'm going to make a prediction. Uh, I was just thinking that, uh, unfortunately, part of the equation in turning people is when things get bad. Because when things are good, people don't care as much. That's right. They're okay. complacent. They're comfortable. Right. And no one wants to move when they're comfortable. Right. So what we're experiencing right now are bad conditions. And, and, and so there's the opportunity then and there um, to um, uh, get people to open their eyes to, to awaken under those adverse conditions. But the prediction I'm going to make is, is how they're the the that where when things get really bad, the opportunity should be there to uh, take a step forward. But I'm concerned about conditions getting really bad and we're taking a step backwards. And that is that there's going to be a single monetary system held out as a solution, and it's going to be supported by the right and the left. Well, and history shows us that that's how they brought in the Federal Reserve. They complained about big banks, and the big right. banks went to Jekyll Island. Mm -hmm. And if what they were doing was above board, they wouldn't have had to assume false identities and lie about who they were, why they were going there. They could have done it above board, but it wasn't. So the nature of how they conduct their activities when you study them tell you a lot about their character. And what we see is we need to work on our we have a multiplicity of problems but we need to work on our own self like our, our own identity to know ourselves because that's how they're controlling us that's how they're manipulating us and we are prevented from making informed decisions because they're occulting or hiding useful information from right. us so the first thing that we need to do is figure out how to cogently communicate with each other we have started that process i think we also need to identify some useful tactics of communication or maybe even map out the, the points of evidence and questions that need to be asked and what type of environment that works and find some use cases where we can say, all right, audience, uh, test this out, see if this works. Uh, it, it shouldn't be a holiday function. We found out that doesn't work. You know, people are like, oh, it's the holiday. I don't want to talk about that right now, right? But what other occasions are Americans trained to get together with their families? But, you know, stop what you're doing, go to the holidays, everyone drive on Thanksgiving and, and do this whole sort of thing. So I think it's part of changing our habits and how we interact with our friends and family and making it more than just holidays when we get together with them. That way you do have some informal occasions when no one's going to be offended if you actually try to express your consciousness and share useful information as human beings because if we don't help each other, I don't know who else is going to help us. And I know that the people that don't want to help us are the, the people that have been controlling everything that we know about history thus far. Let Those people are going to try to pit us against each other whenever they get Well, we know their game plan, and, and they're standing on irrationality, so they're kind of divided and conquered themselves already by assert, asserting that negative. That's yeah. a positive. One of the major problems here is when we begin to, as long as you are operating at a local level, uh, that's fine because, uh, you, you know, you know your local community, you know who you are. If you are uh, uh, operating at a national level, even then, that's, uh, that's fine, you can operate. But what we find that we, uh, when, when it comes to international level, there are two kinds of internationalism. One, where there is a genuine respect for the realities of different national groups, where you listen more than talk. Now, whites have a distinct advantage over the imperialist position because there is a feeling amongst you guys that you are wiser than anyone else. You've got problems you can solve for every group of people. You mean that's not the case? <laughs> that's not You've the seen case. evidence yeah, of the yeah, contrary? Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> and I, sometimes I tell this guy, you know, look, I love you guys, man, white man. Just listen. You know, you, you, you don't have time to listen yet. Because you think you're educated, you have the money, and you've got, come on, you know, be humble enough to realize that some guy in China 
who is speaking and, 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 and articulating his position, he may be wrong, in which case we will correct it. But, and also with women, we don't listen to women and their issues, but we rather pontificate that we have some solutions for their problems. When we do, some of us do, and others don't. So I would like to see an international group really wanting to hear some of the problems, if it is international, how they would suggest, but also saying, you know, you have a very nice idea of what the United States is, democracy, this, that, nonsense, when somebody in, in Burkina Faso uh, sees your embassy infiltrating that country and right. completely destroying that country, then you don't have any idea about what is happening. So one size doesn't fit all. So what I'm hearing is wisdom starts with saying, I don't know, mm -hmm. and that a lot of the ignorance that you're seeing and describing on all these different uh, manifestations, mm -hmm. it starts with uh, the, the Anglo-American establishment, if you will, asserting that they do know mm -hmm. what's best for these other countries and going in and changing uh, you know, uh, their domestic policy from the inside out. And there's, that's what the Council on Foreign Relations mm -hmm. and there's any number of other groups that were created as a, you know, a sub-project of, of that group. Aid, aid, aid uh, organizations. Uh, right, USAID uh, yeah. definitely has a history of that. Uh, uh, well, when you look at, for instance, the National Cancer Society, I believe it is, was started by uh, a, a Marine uh, general named Cornelius Rhodes. Uh, and he did testing on Puerto Ricans. And he has this quote where he's basically implanting cancer into these Puerto Ricans and uh, try, saying he, he's trying to exterminate them. Now he's the, the originator, he's the first president of the National Cancer Society, if, if I, I'll do a footnote if I'm inaccurate on that. Mm. But the point is the nature of the people who are creating these benevolent organizations, these aid organizations, mm -hmm. Bono and Bill Gates mm -hmm. and uh, Mark Cuban advertising this red campaign, mm -hmm. that's blood red, mm -hmm. they're, they're, it's about genocide. They right. have a eugenics agenda where they're trying to sterilize and take away the free rights, the free will, the volition of independent people all over the planet. And the way that they do that to begin with, uh, this is what Tom started with, is education. Because if they can't make us, uh, they can't control us as individuals, they have to make us into kind of this herd mentality of uh, interchangeable parts. Mm -hmm. So bringing it full circle, it, it, it seems like a root cause is education. And that's the way that they're implanting or loading their operating system of empire on minds mm -hmm. all over the planet, independent of nation. Well, there's too few of them to 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 um, put any major you know control system or agenda together without our own cooperation, and that's where the mythologies uh, play the role they do. But uh, we we are used to uh, the nineteen, and this is why when I talk about when I say ninety nine percent supports the unconsciously and sometimes consciously support the one percent, and that while we are pointing a finger at the one percent three fingers are pointing at ourselves that's right saying hey come on guy uh you know they are the crooks but how how do i in my everyday life help to contribute to keep them alive in the way they are so there's a lot of self-reflection uh, well and that self-reflection comes in observing identifying removing the contradictions and trying to communicate cogently to other people so that they can get it because once you've done that you really have solved the problem. You've solved the problem starting here. You've moved from belief and illusion to understanding based on what exists. You've removed any contradictions so that when you communicate to someone else in a, uh, a meaningful format, they can follow along, make this, they, they can, it's like showing someone how you came to a conclusion. It's like step by step from this to this to this and they can follow you. And I think that's a large part of the communication because it's about getting from A to B. Right. One thing I would just say that there is something called love, uh, compassion, which I find missing in this society, in industrial society generally. I mean, uh, you will fully understand this if you come to Africa or Asia or Latin America. Uh, you will find that people are compassionate. I mean, it's not saying the right things for saying the right thing for the right purposes. I mean, really genuinely showing you this love and compassion. And I think we as Americans must begin to say, 
what happened to this absolutely incredible feeling of uh, oneness. They have to put a lot of work into stifling that and stamping it out, don't and they? I, yeah. A lot of work and money, which means it's unnatural. And if they fail to maintain that... Yeah, there was a good ca account, that program we were talking about, um, of uh, post-World War II, how it was in Spain. And um, the people got together in small community, what you would call anarchists, and they, they, they didn't have money. You know, and they all got along fine. And they interviewed people, and they said, "Look, there was just no greed. There was cooperation, and um, you know, you didn't worry about there was no outside incentive to take more than you needed, right? Because it's a survival situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they make us forget that by creating propaganda and spending a billion dollars on a film that has nothing to do with educating you on on how to live life in a way that generates uh, very little regret for yourself or anyone else. Yeah." I would love to see the day when the, uh, the, the state, the United States of America breaks up, the states break up, and the small cantons and the villages have parliaments of their own and the federation of parliaments. I mean, in other words, yes, if I have coal and if you have, I don't know, uh, hydroelectric water or somewhere we can exchange. Is this uh, uh, going back to primitive days, um, I don't think so. I think we're pushing ahead where the human spirit is liberated, where we, we give respect to each other uh, and to the country as a whole. I mean, uh, we're living in, in sophisticated barbarism. It is sophisticated because we use nuclear weapons to threaten other people on the other side of the planet, you know, and, and how do you dismantle an atomic bomb? I think we have to do it through love and empathy and compassion and communication and a lot of learning on our own part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chenge, could you tell me who this, this young, uh, handsome gentleman is? <laughs> yes, just happened to be me. <laughs> well, about what year is this? This must be in the uh, uh, 50s, 60s. 60s? Yeah, 60s. And on what continent is this picture taken? Uh, in the Africa. Uh, Africa continent, but subcontinent South Africa. And particularly, I'm interested in your relationship with this gentleman right here. What's his name and what might he have done that's significant? Oh, it's a good bit. Well, Steve Biko, uh, we call him Steve, uh, came to medical school to study medicine. Uh, and I was at the medical, uh, at the, um, at the University of Natal uh, a few years before him, but I was a part-time student studying at the university in a warehouse, which the university, being a white university, didn't allow white uh, black students to study at the university. And then, of course, uh, in, at 48, in 1948, when the Afrikaners came in, they constructed uh, a philosophy called apartheid. Uh, but I think it is a very misunderstood concept because apartheid segregation uh, both the de facto and de jure existed in South Africa from 16, uh, 1562, I think, or 1652. Um, at that particular time, as soon as uh, the Dutch and the Afrikaner came, and then, of course, the British uh, segregation was taking place, and much of the legislations at that time was uh, very similar to that which took place in 1948. But 1948, uh, it was a carving of the country into little settlements for Afrikaners, uh, English, uh, Africans, and Indians, uh, uh, and then cut out by boundaries. So that was the difference. And Steve came along from King Williamstown uh, to study medicine. And because the medical school was a new, newly founded medical school, it was attached to Natal University, where I was. And I became the president of the student union. And Steve uh, was on my student's council, but I knew him before that. Uh, but I also knew the man behind him, who is Ben Gubane, 
uh, and Ben became, uh, yeah, he was from Natal, and he became a doctor, uh, and then uh, he then um, uh, became the Minister of Culture, Arts, and Science. Uh, and they they were good friends, and of course, uh, three of us became good friends. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Steve uh, had some kind of political education, but w I was at that stage, I had a considerable amount of student political education. And so, uh, and the student movement, because the most of the other political movements were banned, students were playing a very significant role. And because we had a large number of uh, people of color, um, Natal University, uh, uh, where I was, was very central to the liberation struggle and for the students as a whole. And it was the most politically active medical school anywhere in the world. Um, Steve, uh, I left him behind. A lot of revolutions always, uh, a lot of che, uh, che Guevara, a doctor. Yeah, There's a lot of doctors that start revolutions. Precisely, yeah. So, but Steve was thrown out of medical school. What do they, they, if you're active in medical school, in the third year, they give you a particular kind of exam of the frog or something, and uh, normally you fail, no matter how good you are, and uh, then they throw you out. And so th Steve was thrown out of medical school, but I had left by then, and he then, uh, because he was thrown out of medical school, decided to, we had a small clinic by the medical school so that uh, the medical students could go to the hospital, but they couldn't examine white uh, patients. So we had a small clinic built. Uh, and this is, and so um, Steve Biko and Ben and all of them used to practice on the patients there. And I had an American doctor come years later say, that the first time social medicine was ever practiced uh, was that clinic, which then became social medicine in America. Now, much of what you're describing was uh, immortalized in the 1987 Richard Attenborough film, Cry Freedom. Yes. And so uh, the clinic is in there uh, showing uh, not the origins of apartheid, but definitely its effect on the indigenous population, uh, the origin of the black consciousness movement, which Steve's really the originator of. And, yeah. and that comes up today in the form of the Black Panthers and the new Black Panther Party. And so when you go back to seeing how apartheid triggered the black consciousness movement, gave leaders like Mandela to the world, my question to you would be, uh, are there differences in reality from the Hollywoodization of Biko's story, for instance, or even Mandela's story? And if so, what types of hyperbole are used for the, the, the crowd, uh, crowd control through the propaganda? This is done very, very subtly. I mean, first of all, uh, the black consciousness movement uh, partly took over the actions of what was called the Pan-African uh, um, uh, Congress. Congress, right. Pan-African Congress was, uh, Saboko was a leader, an, an extraordinary leader uh, of, of uh, Pan-African. Uh, so I, uh, for some reason, I, you know, we had a very strong Pan-African society on the campus. Uh, I'm not sure why Steve didn't join them. I think Steve wanted to be a leader on his own right. And then, of course, he joined with students in the what is so called black universities, which we uh, belonging to the National Union of Students, both whites and African, not Africaners, Africaners kept their own thing. We uh, decided that we are not, while we support the students at the uh, Bantustan universities, but we will not legitimate them. We will not legitimate the university. We will not legitimate the teachers at the university. In other words, the Bantustan policy was unacceptable to the ANC. By Bantustan, you mean the area where the Bantu live, Bantu Stephen Biko. You had to identify yourself as a Bantu and not, so no one would confuse you with a white South African. Is that correct? Uh, no, the, the, the Bantus are one group of people. There are uh, Swazis and there are Shonas. There are various different 
nations. They're, they're kept segregate, segregated. Though, yeah, in, they've, uh, been, yeah, they've been living separately. But Bantustan uh, was one term used by the government. Okay. Bantustan leaders. So Steve um, started a number of uh, mainly social programs. And that was the Black Consciousness Movement. And they were, but uh, Steve also had uh, a young man called Strini Mudli, who was an Indian, whom I knew earlier on, who had a play where he met Biko. So uh, I got, I knew both of these kids, you see, younger than myself. So, so, uh, so they, they seem to have attracted a large, and, and remember by the time Steve was, uh, on the scene, uh, we in, in, in the external uh, had raised this anti-apartheid struggle all over the world, and so a great pressure was being applied to um, to South Africa, and so Steve Biko's consciousness um, uh, attracted young black students, and like never before, and so in '76 there was great riots in Soweto where uh, the police attacked the students, uh, uh, killed uh, a few, and the rest went, fled into exile. And uh, of course, soon after, uh, in 77, Biko was killed. I mean, he was, he was, he was uh, tortured and then driven. My wife did some work on all these doctors who were involved with this, not only Biko, but uh, apartheid. And he was driven from uh, Cape Town to Pretoria, which is a long, long way. It's like six hours or eight yeah, hours. Eight hours, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the whole country erupted. Uh, uh, Steve wasn't a violent guy. I mean, you know, uh, he was strong-headed, no doubt. Uh, and I remember uh, the day he was killed, I was walking to collect unemployment in London, you know, when I saw this headline. So, um, and I'm going to give the Steve Biko lecture this year, which is a big lecture in South Africa uh, at Vets University. Uh, so um, I have to gather some information before I, I do that. Uh, but there's very little um, I can say. I mean, I, I, uh, all I, you know, there was a lot of support on the ground. And so, uh, but I, why I got involved in all of this, don't ask me that. I don't know. Well, you're not a white South African. <laughs> you're not the grandchild of Cecil Rhodes, no, so no, you don't have I interest know, but in I was, establishment. But, but you know, I lived in this village. I mean, God, everybody went to work in the factory. I mean, there was very few people that went to university or part-time or full-time. I did this part-time all the time. I mean, you know, I, I failed my exams and what have you not. Uh, but it was, it's a miracle that I, you know, that Steve Biko became Steve Biko and uh, and Ben Goban has become, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, we are simple people, you know. So, um, But your proof that simple individuals, as you describe yourself, can have powerful effects and can say things that resonate through time and, and people use them in ways that you might not have, have ever imagined. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, there's no political ambitions, you know. As I said, I could become member of parliament tomorrow, whatever in South Africa, you know. I, uh, I, I just want to be a simple, ordinary guy in the street. I mean, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that, you know. Um, yeah, and and this young lady there is, uh, um, uh, he's the wife of. Uh, the British uh, consulate who was in South Africa at that time, John Savage, uh, a very nice guy and his wife. Uh, you know, the question amongst all of us was, is this a CIA agent here? So, uh, not her, but the husband. I mean, you know. <laughs> Out of the four, which would be the CIA <laughs> agent? <I don't> know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but Bridget, um, was a delightful woman. I mean, you know, and her husband too. Did she try to incite violence? Did she any, have any of the hallmarks of a no, no, agent no, no, provocateur? No, 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 no. <laughs> so we have, well, this is be, taking behind the house. We're sitting in the garden. 
another garden we just uh, lawn behind ours. As a matter of fact, this picture is in the uh, archives, not archives, in the Apartheid Museum in Durban, I mean in, in Johannesburg. So it's a, it's a rare picture, you know. I could impress you and tell you that's where I got it, but it's not. You got it from where? <laughs> I got it from your desk <laughs> really? before you moved. I, I made a copy of it, so when we interviewed you, I could ask you about it. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this, Cheng Yan. As someone who has been persona non grata in South Africa, you got yourself, um, you know, t- mm. uh, they got the label, the mantle hung on you of political prisoner, and you didn't let that stop you. You didn't stay there. You left the country. You went to England. You saw these fine people at Oxford who have been colonizing the world, so you started studying the opposition, as it were. So after a a long life of a a lot of interesting experiences, what phrase, what thought, what expression comes to mind that you would want people for for here and evermore to hear? Like if you could say something that everyone on the planet would hear, what would it be? What what would it be? I mean, I... um uh you know the fundamental value that you have cherished in the world nothing must change that uh you know either wealth or education uh whatever profession you get into uh i you know I, but but coming out where did this thing come from i'm not sure but uh finally uh, reinforced by Ramakrishna, the saint, uh, on whom I have written a book but not published yet, which I want to publish. But Ramakrishna said there's two ways to reach God, if, if this is the way, through consciousness, through meditation and whatever you not. One way is bhakta, which means you pray, you know, like all the saints and, and um, uh, uh, religious people. And the other is you work for it. Uh, yeah, you, Hatha, uh, is it correct? Yes, Hatha Yoga, where you go and serve humanity. And, and you, know, you, don't, you don't look for the rewards. Well, that reminds me of uh, Hanuman. Hanuman. The story of Hanuman yes. is the service. Yes. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ram Das is servant of a god. god these right. sort of ideas. Right. right. And, and I thought that was, you know, Christ in some ways, uh, I, I would have thought as a fisherman, as, as somebody who was working with the truth, I'm not, not the interpretation later on. I mean, here he was simply riding his donkey and passing the message. I mean, he didn't want to be any more than that. So, so um, can people engaged in politics be also spiritual? I, I think that's so important fundamentally. I mean, I... I, I I firmly believe that if you are engaged in any kind of political activity or social change, you must become spiritual, not not religious. I mean, yeah, I think you've got to get past that. And that's just simply being conscious and engaging in life and, and keeping it real. Yeah, yeah. Just being morally, you know, purifying yourself all the time and saying, you know, I've got this thought, this thought, is it is it right or wrong? Is it morally moral? And so you're constantly uh, subjecting to your, yourself with uh, dialectical thinking all the time. What does liberty mean to you? Well, liberty doesn't simply. Uh, you, uh, the other words, you, you might be asking, what what is freedom to sure. you? Sure. Yeah, and and and, and um, uh, a freedom has. Uh, uh, severe restrictions. Uh, freedom is not freedom as one would uh, conceptualize the issue. Uh, freedom is uh, expressing the truth and living by the truth. Now, uh, the question then becomes, what is the truth? And then, and how does one come to know the truth? The truth. Then you've got to be an investigative journalist. In other words, you have to um, see what uh, the great masters, and that I include women, who have gone before you and who have articulated both physical and metaphysical uh, ideas about the social, political, economic realities. And so then you, you come across what, what is called philosophically universals, 
the universals of justice, uh, the universality of uh, kindness, compassion, and so on. And so you find that all uh, the, 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 the great religious leaders like uh, the Dalai Lama, uh, Gandhi, uh, to some extent Martin Luther King, uh, I'm trying to find a, uh, a Mother Teresa. Sure. There's these kinds of eternal truth. Uh, and so uh, freedom is the kind of freedom that they exercise its metaphysical freedoms together with the freedom of uh, making sure that uh, there is political, uh, legal, and other justices. So um, and I used to have a great problem with uh, with John Humphreys. John Humphreys, I must have told you, was a professor of uh, law. He was one of the guys who, uh, with, uh, with Mrs. Roosevelt and really Casson, uh, wrote out the Declaration of Human Rights for the United Nations. It was the uh, United Nations, and so I was. Um, I used to be uh, attending a lot of here. Uh, we, we were co-speakers for Amnesty International, or whatever the, the, the students called it, the meeting and so on. Well, anyway, and then we became friends, in, uh, and then I attended a course that he had set up in PEI. Uh, uh, to, to the objectiveness of the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I said it was a wonderful thing as a document. It's like a constitution, but I said it has no effective. There isn't any mechanism for its enforceability. Uh, and it's not a binding contract because people haven't agreed to it, so there's not consideration. It hasn't. All the all the uh, the constituents of a contract haven't taken place. You're right. And, 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 and then, again, if it, it remains at a very, very objective level. Uh, there is very little subjectivity in, in transforming a society that, uh, um, you know, like, to some extent, uh, Israel at the moment, uh, practicing, or South Africa and so on, uh, very little has been done to, uh, to, uh, uh, to transform that. So I think that, that the, um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a good document, but like everything else, it's put on the shelf. And conveniently, from time to time, nations say, well, look, we have been. Uh, I think it should be brought down from the shelf uh, and, and dusted and really uh, seriously seen to be effective at various levels of society. Uh, there must be enforce, enforceability, and there must be some kind of pressure that uh, these things are fundamentally operating. Otherwise, they're a dead duck, as indeed we've seen uh, in, in many societies.